Okay, time again for another action-packed uh, video presentation. Uh, today I'm in the physics office here, and you can see the uh, emergency shower over here. How many of you are hoping I'll just uh, pull that and see how much water comes down on my head? Well, it's not going to happen. Today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about universal gravitation. And... Um, well, this is a pretty interesting one here, and this is one of the brilliant things that Isaac Newton did come up with. So we're going to talk about the universal gravitation, uh, Isaac Newton. All right, so just some things that we'd like you to come away with on this, and one of the things is this uh, causes of motion that we've been talking about, that we called Newton's laws so far, have really affected the way we world, uh, look at our world, and really now, with universal gravitation, I can talk about the way we look at the universe. So let's ask ourselves, as we're going through this, what can be accomplished? What uh, meaning is for this uh, stuff outside of the classroom? How did this change the way we view the universe, and uh, how does it affect our times right now? And uh, that should be a thing that you're asking for everything that we do. How could this be important outside of the classroom? Okay, so this is the famous deal with Newton. The uh, apple fell on his head, and he had a flash of insight, a flash of brilliant insight, really, where he said that the force that was pulling on the apple was the same force that was working on the moon and, in fact, was working on everything in the universe. Now, if I asked you what is the force that keeps the moon going around the earth or the apple falling to the ground, I'm guessing most people would say gravity. And you'd be correct, of course, but it was radical in his time and a definitely a new view of what was going on. I did say when we went over Newton's laws that Galileo had come up with all of those before Newton was born, and that's true, but uh, this is pure Newton here. He took it a lot further, standing on the shoulders of giants, if you remember. He took it a lot further. Very significant. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so once again, he used this to explain everything. The moon, the apple... And uh, really the big thing that he was talking about is that there's a force of attraction between every two objects in the universe. So um, whether it's the moon or an apple or, uh, you know, the, the books behind me on the shelf there, there's an attraction between every two objects in the universe. Okay. So before this, and just to talk about how radical an idea it is, people were really you know, they kind of trying to figure out what was going on in the earth, but they really thought that the heavens up there in the sky, things were a little bit different. And then there was, you know, if you remember with the Greeks, uh, that was this, the home of the gods and the constellations, there were stories for that. And we thought, well, this is beyond the realm of human understanding. That was the general uh, idea before people like Galileo and Newton came along, uh, which is uh, something that we take for granted now, but was pretty significant at the time. Okay, so there were lots of different stories about what was going on in space. Uh, did you know that there uh, was a princess that was banished to the moon and sent to live on the moon? And that's what the moon was. It was a home for this banished princess. But they didn't want her to be alone, <clears throat> so they sent a giant rabbit with her uh, to live on the moon. That was a Chinese mythology uh, for an expl explanation of why the moon was where it was. And um, we don't, uh, you know, we don't really necessarily agree that there's a Chinese princess on the moon right now or a giant rabbit there, but there have been countless stories, uh, some that are forgotten for all time, of what's going on in the skies. But Newton really did come up with a, an explanation that's kind of took hold for 400 years and has uh, affected our times, continues to affect us. Okay, so if there is an attraction between every two objects in the universe... What are the things that are going to affect this attraction, this force of attraction? Well, if we thought about it a little bit, we'd probably come up with the answers. You might be thinking about it already. One of the things is going to be how much mass you're talking about. The bigger the mass, the bigger the attraction. And another thing that you could talk about is the distance. The farther away they get, the less the attraction is going to be. And that should make some kind of sense if we think about it. Okay, so here is the law of universal gravitation. And G here is a constant. M's are the masses that we're familiar with, so this time there'll be two masses involved. And R is going to be the center-to-center -center distance between them. 
G, as I said before, capital G, is a universal gravitational constant. The lower letter G that we've been using, which is 9.8 on Earth, changes different places in the universe. But this one, the capital G, is constant throughout the universe. If there is intelligent life on other planets, they might not speak English, they might not speak French, or Norwegian, or Russian, or any of that stuff. But if they are able to get to us, they will have to understand this idea of universal gravitation. So we will have something in common. Okay. So here's a problem that we could be doing, right? Here are the two masses. Here's the distance apart. You know, of course, we would identify the information for this problem. We would go ahead and solve it. And uh, give it a try. Go ahead and solve that problem. See what you can do. Okay. Here's the answer that I came up with. And this is obviously in scientific notation. To write this out, it would be point zero zero zero, you know, uh, nine zeros in front of that, or ten zeros in front of that. Uh, so we're going to use scientific notation. And if you put your calculator in scientific mode, it'll automatically put the answer in scientific notation. Here's another clue I have for you. Um, on the calculators, uh, it's different on different calculators, but there's something that's called an EXP or a double E key. And uh, when you were typing in the universal gravitational constant, what, how did you type it in? Probably 6.7, and as I have here, times 10 raised to the negative 11th. So that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I would just say that you are going to get better results in the long run if you use this EXP key or the double E key. And when you type that in, uh, it just takes the place of the time 10 raised to. So you would type in, if you had an EXP key, 6.67 EXP negative 11. Just cut out the middleman. Saves you some typing, uh, but also your calculator deals with it a little bit better. If you are more comfortable using the times 10 raised to, it'll give you the same answer. The thing I would recommend is that whenever you do that, put the number in parentheses. You know, so in, in other words, you would open parentheses 6.67 times 10 raised to the negative 11th and close the parentheses. Uh, that's particularly important when the number that you're using with scientific notation is on the bottom of the fraction in the denominator. Just a little tip for you. If you like to try that, that's okay. All right, so in the universe here, you are told that you have a force of attraction between every two objects in the universe, but you don't necessarily feel that force of attraction. You don't notice it. And why would that be true? Something for you to think about, and we can uh, talk about again in class. Okay, um, so, <laughs> well, <laughs> I've already given up the answer, so uh, here we go. It's because the objects have to be very close to you and they have to be very massive in order for you to feel it. You know, in that example that I gave, it was 2.5 times 10 to the negative 11th. That's a very small force of attraction, plus it's counteracted by all these other small forces of attractions. But there is something that is very close to us and very massive that we are going to recognize the force to that all the time, and that's our Earth. We're pretty close to the Earth, right? If you think you're not attracted to the Earth, try jumping up sometime. See if you don't come crashing back down again. That's because you have a very large attraction uh, with the Earth. Okay, so, yeah, there you go. Um, all right, now, there is a name that we are familiar with for this force of attraction that we feel with the Earth, and that is our weight. And we have been calculating weight with the equation W is equal to mg. So let's do that here. Let's, uh, let's uh, do that with this 65 kilogram mass. Let's use W is equal to mg. And uh, if you do that, you should come up with 637 newtons. So make sure you show your work for that one. There should be work shown uh, there. Okay, so what I want to do on this next slide is give you a little bit of practice uh, with using scientific notation for very large and very small numbers in the same problem. This is where it gets a little bit complicated and um, let's see how you do with that. But also I want to point out that this is a way of figuring out the weight. And uh, if we are talking about the 65 kilogram object and we use the mass of the Earth, which is given to you here, and the radius of the Earth um, as the value for R, we should come up with the same answer. The math is a little bit tougher though, but we, we get a little bit of practice uh, in the calculator. So here's your mass number one, here's your mass number two, and here's your R value. Well, the radius of the Earth, the distance to the center, you can think to yourself, but I'm right on the surface of the Earth. Why would it be this big number? 
But remember, the R value in these equations is the center to center distance. So there's the radius of the Earth. All right, so really, uh, if you plug all these numbers in, you should get a number that's basically 637. Uh, you know, with a little bit of rounding there, but this is what the calculator will tell you if you did it properly. So it's a good test for a couple of things, seeing if you could put this problem together, but also seeing if you can get the calculator to do what you want it to do. It's complicated, uh, but it's possible, and of course, like all of this stuff, a little bit of practice goes a long way. Okay, so let's try it here. We have the idea of universal gravitation. What's the weight of a 50 kilogram person on this uh, planet, this hypothetical uh, planet? Here is your R value, the radius of this planet. Here is one of your masses. Here's your second mass. What is the force or weight? So give it a try. Identify your information, solve the problem, and see what kind of answer you come up with. And when you come back, I'll give the answer. Hey, welcome back. How did that go for you? Well, I came up with 1.74 times 10 to the third newtons, 1,740, if you want to put it in the uh, long form there. But how did you do? Um, if you had troubles with that, give it another try. See what you can do there. And if you're still having problems, uh, bring that question to class with you. And uh, we'll certainly go over it. Now here's a follow-up question. We've talked about the idea that small g is 9.8 meters per second squared on Earth, but it's different other places in the universe. So here's a follow-up question. What's the acceleration due to gravity on this planet? Well, here's my answer, 34.8 meters per second squared. Did you get that? Well, if you didn't and you're scratching your head a little bit, let me give you a little something to go on here. And that is that, remember, W is equal to mg, right? And here we figured out that the weight of this person on this planet was 1,740 newtons, and their mass was 50 kilograms. So if you plug those numbers into this equation and solve for g, you should get the answer that I got, the 34.8 uh, meters per second squared. All right, let's see here. Here's another tricky problem, right? How about the space shuttle flying above the Earth? Well, let's see, we used to have a space shuttle, but let's say a, a spaceship is flying above the surface of the Earth. What's the gravitational force of a 60 kilogram person? Well, okay, here's mass number one, and uh, mass number two would be the mass of the Earth that I gave you in that previous problem. You probably already have that in your notes if you wrote that down. But how about the R value? That's a little bit tricky. Well, why don't you give it a try, see if you can figure it out. Here's the answer I got, 541.17 newtons. How did you do with that? Well, give it a try. See if you can get that answer. Uh, okay. All right, if you're back from trying that problem and you had troubles getting that answer, maybe this is what happened. Um, turns out the R value isn't going to be the 270,000 meters. Did you use that as the R value? Well, I understand why you would do that, but remember, R is the center to center distance. So here, if you are 270,000 meters above the surface of the planet, you also, do you recognize this number? You have to add that to the radius of the Earth because it's the center to center distance. So it'll be the distance that the space shuttle or spaceship is to the surface of the planet plus that entire radius of the Earth. And uh, that's the trick to this problem. And also the trick to, uh, you know, uh, another part of the trick is getting the calculator to do what you want. Come on, people. It's not rocket science. Well, actually, I can't say that here. It is rocket science, isn't it? Uh, so, yeah, yeah, it's rocket science, and people know that that can be a little bit difficult. So, uh, good deal. So, if you can solve these problems, you're doing basic rocket science. So, congratulations. Uh, you know, if you're flexible enough, you pat yourself on the back uh, for those accomplishments. And if you're still having problems after watching this video, we're going to work on it in class. So, you're going to get a chance to pat yourself on the back. And really, if you're trying these problems, even if you got the wrong answer, you should be patting yourself on the back. Because that is a good job every time. You, uh, try your best, right? Okay, so uh, how about this one? What is the acceleration due to gravity at that location where the space shuttle is located? Well, here's the answer that I got. Ooh, look at that space shuttle flying around. Let's do that again. Ooh, look at that. Ooh, wait. Yep, yeah, all right. Well, here's the answer that I got, 9.02 meters per second squared. And again, that was just W is equal to mg. You found the weight, 
you know, the mass, and here you get the idea that the acceleration due to gravity is less because we're farther away from the center of the Earth. Did you know that it's not as dramatic, but if you are up in Colorado on the highest mountains that we have in the United States, then the acceleration due to gravity will be a little bit less uh, than it would be here in Monroe, which is so close to sea level. And again, it's because of that R value. The center-to-center -center distance becomes a little bit greater. Okay, so... The big question, I mean, if you can solve these problems, that's great, but how does this affect our times? You know, how does this affect our times? Well, you know, we have the moon going around the Earth, and then we got an idea of why the moon does that, but we do a lot more than just have the moon as a satellite of the Earth. We have created a whole entire deal here with a satellite. So here's an image uh, that depicts all the satellites are up on Earth. So you like making your cell phone calls, you like sending your text messages, well, the ones that you're sending in class, <laughs> they might be uh, bounced off a local tower, but if you're sending them a little bit farther away, uh, boom, off a satellite and uh, to anywhere in the world. It's phenomenal to think about, and it's happened so quickly that we really don't think about it. But we can get images from anywhere on the planet uh, almost instantaneously, and uh, that's a little bit different than what Newton could do. But he certainly had dreamed up uh, uh, some of the things that uh, are behind this. So uh, hats off to Isaac Newton on this one. I took Newton's laws away from him and credited Galileo with him, but he definitely took it a whole lot further. And uh, the lives that we have right now are, are largely affected by that. So not bad to have a little understanding of that. Well, that's it for this presentation. I hope you found it helpful. And uh, like I said, it is rocket science. So if there's anything that was problematic in there where you weren't getting my answers, bring it back to class. And I'm sure we can sort it out there. And I will look forward to seeing you there.